So I'm going to start off um, with, and well, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us today um, to at our event, uh, visiting the London Muslim community through the lens of CFPL TV. Um, I want to start off before we do anything with um, a couple of land, land acknowledgements. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, um, and the Mississaugas of the credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, we, I, especially, I work um, on Tacranto, often known as Toronto. Uh, we acknowledge that this land has been stolen from its caretakers and the facilitators acknowledge our own role as settlers and continuing the legacy of colonial violence and genocide. We also acknowledge that for some racialized non-Indigenous peoples, coming to Tur Turtle Island was not a choice. Because we are virtually uh, visiting London, Ontario today, um, we, we, and we have a large group of Londoners here tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge the land on which London situates. Uh, situates. It's it, it is a traditional territory of the Adawandiran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, on Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban Indigenous population who make the City of London home. We value the significant historical and contemporary con contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. So again, welcome everyone tonight uh, to tonight's event. My name is Mosca Roque, and I'm the archivist of the Muslims in Canada archives at the University of Toronto. Today's event would not have been possible without our partners at Ontario's Provincial Archives, Archives of Ontario, and specifically my co-host for tonight, uh, Senior Archivist at the Archives of Ontario, Sean Smith. Um, I'm going to make sure to introduce Sean in just a second. Um, I wanted to quickly go over what we'll be doing today. So, you know, after uh, obviously the introductions, we'll be screening short new, uh, news clips from the archives of the CFPL TV, which showcase some of the earliest footage of London's Muslim community dating from the late 1950s. Um, before that, um, we'll hear a little bit about the history of the CFPL, Archives of Ontario, and the context within which these clips uh, came to be. Um, and after the screenings, we also have two guest speakers from London's Muslim communities who will speak briefly and then we'll uh, want to hear from all of you in an open discussion that we had mentioned earlier. Right, so um, as I mentioned, um, I'm the archivist for the Muslims in Canada archives, uh, which is situated actually at the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto. We are a community centered archive dedicated to the preservation of Canadian Muslim histories. Um, actually, so on that note, I wanted to turn things over to the director of U of T's Institute of Islamic Studies, Professor Amber Iman, to say a few words before we begin tonight's event. Thank you, Moscow. Uh, first of all, it's a real pleasure to have this event. Uh, and I wanna thank Sean from Archives Ontario for being with us today. Archives Ontario is one of the partner organizations that engages uh, MICA. We work directly, we work closely with, with our Archives Ontario and we're grateful for their ongoing collaboration. Uh, and, and, and in particular, I wanna thank Sean for really spearheading um, the collaborative nature of our relationship. So many thanks to Archives Ontario. Uh, I also want to uh, extend our thanks to many of the members of the London, London community, uh, many of them who are here, many of whom we've spoken to in advance, uh, to, to think with us about preserving this city's um, Muslim contributions to its heritage and the larger heritage of Canada. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to host this particular forum. Obviously, focusing on London is not a coincidence. The last summer's tragic events in the city really galvanized all of us, galvanized the nation around violence against a very distinctive community, one that has been subject to surveillance for quite some time under a national security lens. Part of the vision of MICA 
as an archives is to change the narrative of how Muslims are represented in part by giving Muslims their voice back. And we do that through the collection of records and then uh, through collaboration with other institutions like Ontario's making them available. Uh, we're not here to tell the stories. The stories are told by you, by others who come and work with us to tell those stories. And after the last few weeks watching Ottawa being, uh, being taken over by, uh, by a convoy, particularly starting on January 29th, the day of action against Islamophobia, we're committed and convinced that an institution like MICA is even more necessary to make sure that convoy or not, we don't forget. Nobody forgets. And MICA's whole raison d'etre is to make sure nobody forgets. And so it's, uh, it's with that spirit that I'm grateful to all of you for coming today to collectively remember together about London, its history, the Muslim contribution to that city's history that continued to make it such a vibrant part of the Ontario and the Canadian fabric. And so grateful for many people from London themselves who've made this particular event and are participating today. I wanna to welcome them as well with much, much, much gratitude. And hopefully this is the first of many conversations we have about London and other cities in Ontario and across Canada. So thank you all very much. And, it's, uh, and again, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enver, for that. Okay, so without further ado, uh, um, saving the best for last, I want to now introduce you to my co-host, co-moderator for this evening, Sean Smith. So Sean is a senior archivist in the Collections Development and Management Unit at the Archives of Ontario, located in Toronto, Ontario. He previously held positions at the Clara Thomas Archives at York University and Librarian Archives Canada. In total, he has been preserving and sharing history for over 20 years. During the pandemic, he has focused on issues related to community engagement, GLAM, Wiki, and digital records. He is an active member of the archival community in Canada, as well as a runner, a reader, and a father of two. Thank you for being with us today, Sean. I will pass the floor on to you now to talk a little bit about the AO and uh, CFPL. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Can we just go to the next slide? I think it's, uh, yeah. So first of all, I, I can't tell you enough uh, how proud I am to be here with you tonight and how happy I am to be welcome uh, to, to share sort of these films with you and to uh, just be able to, to learn from uh, the community in London as you reflect upon the films and as you start to sort of think about the fact that uh, the Muslim community has been, you know, the Muslim, the, the London Muslim Mosque has is coming up on its 60th anniversary in, in London, which is an astounding fact um, in and of itself. And the community has been there even longer. But so much of that history and those stories are, are, are not known by the, the, the wide uh, swath of Ontario's imagination. And so hopefully tonight, just through being able to share 10 minutes of history, um, we can start to make those stories visible. We can start to challenge stereotypes. We can uh, put people into a different frame of mind when we think about the place of people in, in London, in London, Ontario. Um, this really came about uh, through, uh, I think a concerted effort to change the way that we approach our job at the Archives of Ontario. We are the second largest archives in the, in, in the country. We are the largest provincial archives. We have been around since 1903 doing this work. Um, but I think over the last four to five years, we really started to think uh, about what it is that we do in telling Ontario's history and telling Ontario's story. Are we doing a good enough job? Are we truly representing all of the people who, call, who, who make Ontario their home or who have lived here? And so I think what we've really shifted away from is, is all the old ways that we have done stuff to really think more uh, outwardly and more forwardly in terms of how we can be engaging more communities and bringing, bringing the multiplicity of stories into Ontario's narrative. And, and that comes with a, a different approach to doing the work that we do. I think archives in a lot, of, a lot of the times would define success by acquiring records. But for us, I think the change has come in that we're shifting away from necessarily acquiring records uh, to justify what we do, to building relationships as justifying what we do. 
So what we've, what we've been doing and what we've been focusing on over the last couple of years is just in embedding ourselves into uh, different communities, reaching out to communities, seeing where memory work is being done across the province and, and figuring out how we can fit into supporting the work that's being done uh, in, in those different places. MICA is a phenomenal example of this. Um, we reached out to MICA, I think it was actually almost two years ago, March uh, 2020, uh, really to sort of see what role we could play in supporting MICA in terms of um, developing its program, in terms of you know, sharing professional discussions around uh, community engagement, amongst other things, collections development, just really thinking about what it is we could do to support MICA. And then evolving our relationship to try and figure out what, are, what our role to play is in, in documenting Muslim history in Ontario. Um, we think we have a role to play. MICA certainly has a primary role to play in, in doing that work, but as the provincial archives, we think it's our responsibility too to be involved and to, to, to preserve records. If, if uh, following MICA's lead, it seems like we're the more appropriate place for, for those records. So hopefully that's, this is a relationship that's going to continue and this is something that we continue to, to sort of talk about and to figure out as we, we, we find places for more Muslim history in Ontario, in Ontario for sure. Um, can we just go to the next slide? So as I said, we have been doing this work since 1903 at the Archives of Ontario. We have a lot of stuff, but we don't have everything. Um, and that's that's sort of the, the question we've been asking ourselves and sort of the spaces that we've been we've been looking at. But what we do have is we do have the records of CFPL TV. So for those of you who are in London, Ontario, CFPL is probably a, a channel that you know. Um, it's now a part of the Bell, Bell Media. Um, but from about 1953 to the eight, 1980s, uh, almost, a, almost as far as 1990, it was a privately run uh, TV station. So in a lot of ways, it was London's voice. It was London's eyes on the world. Um, it was telling the story of, of what was going on in London, but it was also, uh, it was also London's uh, focus on, on sort of international events as well. It's a vast and it's a huge collection at the archives. Um, as you can see, there's over 1100 hours of moving image records, um, as well as textual records and, and other types of, types of, of material. Um, and it's a treasure trove of understanding uh, the stories and the history of London, Ontario. Last summer, uh, it's no secret that London was hit with a horrendous tragedy, the murder of the Oxfall family. Um, and uh, I'm not going to pretend that it's, 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 I was hit as, as hard as probably many of you were, but it was something that recognizing the fact that we had been working with Micah and supporting Micah and developing a friendship with Micah, it, it did hit, hit me personally pretty hard. And it brought into question exactly what we were doing and what would you do if you're trying to build a relationship and you're developing friendships? What is it possible? What was it possible for us to do as, a, as an archives? And so the smallest thing that we could do was to reach out and, and offer to sort of take the records that we did have that documented uh, the London Muslim community and try and make them public at the right time in a hope that in some small way uh, that we could help uh, a little bit with, with healing. And, and if not that, that we could at least be doing our job to make Muslim history visible. Uh, and so I, I do need to say that uh, I'm incredibly proud of the institution that I, that I, that I work at, the Archives of Ontario, uh, because when I pitched the idea to my leadership, there was not one uh, moment of hesitation. Everybody was on board that this was something that we needed to do and that was our responsibility to do. And as I said, it was a, the smallest thing that we could do. Um, and so I'm really glad that over the course of time, uh, we've been able to sort of get the support of many people at the archives and having these films digitized um, and working, working with Micah and making the event possible. Um, and as I said, just giving back in the smallest way that we can to the community in London and uh, doing our bit to try making some of this history uh, available. So what we're going to do tonight is we have about 10 uh, news stories. 
uh, from CFPL TV uh, that we're going to roll. Um, the stories uh, document uh, sort of uh, the early days of the uh, London Muslim community when it, when the mosque was in, in effect somebody's house, a house. Um, it, it goes from 1959 to uh, the late 70s. And then there's one bit at the end which backs things up to 1952 um, and is part of a, a news program that sort of it looks at, at exploring uh, the Muslim world. One thing that I was saying to Mosca before this, and it was something that I didn't necessarily uh, click on to, uh, is this is deep history. So as I said, the films go back, uh, you know, 60, 65 years. Um, which really shows sort of the depth of, uh, of the, the history in the London community. And, and some of you know it much more intimately than, than we do and than I do. Um, and so hopefully as we show these, these films, they'll, they'll, they'll bring back memories. Uh, there'll be th things in the films that you will see that maybe we'll be able to, to hear from you about. Um, so we're going to give space in between each of the films uh, with the hopes that uh, that it will, it will elicit some response from the people who are, who are sitting with us tonight and we can learn from you uh, what we're seeing. As I said, the films themselves are clips, they're not super long. Um, and so, but I, st I still think that they are incredibly evocative and, and they, they, um, they, put, uh, they put the history of, of the, the community in London sort of where it should be and that's front and center and on the screen. Um, the CFPL, the way that CFPL worked um, was the way that most news, news uh, stations uh, did. So these are all, for the most part, silent clips, um, and they need to be paired with, uh, with scripts. Uh, so we have the scripts, we have the footage, and we are archivists, we are not actors. Um, if there are any actors in the audience, please raise your hand. Uh, but we are going to try and sort of sync uh, the scripts with the films as best as we can. Uh, we might be reaching out to some people in the audience to do the reading for us, so it may be messy, but uh, that's the nature of, uh, of this event tonight, and, and certainly uh, we hope you can appreciate the fact that, uh, that we're all coming at this together. We're all in the same room, whether we like it or not, and that uh, we'll sort of move forward with, with that in mind, and, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll get it going. Thank you, Sean. Yes, as uh, Sean mentioned, oh, thank you, Emily, for sharing the script. So uh, Emily has shared a link to um, a Google document that has the script for each news clipping that we'll be um, playing. Again, the clippings are silent, except for um, you know, except for one of them. Um, most of the rest are silent. So um, what Sean and I will. Um, read out the script for the first two and then we'll we'd love to have some help from the audience um if you can read the third or the you know the next ones following that one um uh we we may i may either i may either call people out on the, from the um uh, from the participants list or if you if you'd like to read from the script please raise your hand once we get there so i'm going to stop sharing oh Right. Um, I, I should um, mention this too before we go on. So before we go on, we also want to acknowledge that there are some terms in the clips that are uh, that may be offensive uh, and incorrect. Um, we've left them in the script uh, because they provide valuable context for what society and life was like in London at the time that they were written. Okay, so I will have to stop sharing my uh, slides here and now i'll share the um the video just bear with me for just a second um just uh, as a note uh, the chat is now enabled so if again if you'd like to um read any of the scripts um once uh, once you had to take a look at them later on, um, please let us know in the chat or put your hand up and we'll unmute you. Okay, so can is is that okay? Can you everyone see that? Oh, I don't think I shared the sound. I'm gonna have to probably do this again. One moment. Oops. So, oh. 
sorry again. Let's stop that and then share share with the sound. There we go. Okay, that's okay. You can see that. Okay, great. Do you uh, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Okay, I can go first. So no the problem. just to give you, we'll try and give you some uh, heads up. The first clip is actually we'll be seeing it twice because it yes. was shown at two different uh, two different times within a couple of days. So we will uh, we'll be we'll be doing it doing it twice. Okay, and I also just got someone uh, that wants to um, read this one of the scripts after us. So we already got a volunteer. Um, all right, so let me play this. So for the first time ever, the Islamic Youth Association of the United States and Canada is holding its annual conference in London. London's Muslim mosque is a fairly recent addition to the city's many religious institutions. Today, the conference opened with a discussion on problems confronting the young Muslim in North America. Uh, about 50 young followers of Islam are attending the conference. They came from across Ontario uh, and from Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. The conference continues tomorrow. Um, its purpose is to discuss and perhaps solve the many problems which face a young Muslim in North America as a member of a minority group. Uh, I didn't go fast enough. <laughs> um so uh, so that was the that was the first clip uh, so we we kind of have a um we kind of wanted to keep this um this part of the the event a little bit open so if anybody has any comments that they'd like to make from that first clip please again raise your hand put it in the chat i can read anything in the chat if you'd like um and uh, and then we'll move on to the next clip um I'll, let me just open the participants list to make sure I can see people putting their hand up. Okay. I'll give it a few minutes. <laughs> yes, so love the so so love the way they were all dressed so very well attired. Yes. <laughs> so right, the one was... thing I, I found really um fascinating by, by the clips is I think most people have a baked in sort of stereotype of what they think of when, uh, you know, you consider uh, a person of the Muslim faith, of the Islam, Islamic faith in, in, in current society. Certainly there's no shortage of stereotype with typical uh, images on the screen, but, uh, you know, that didn't necessarily match the, what we saw on, on, on this, on the, in this clip. Uh, I guess, and I should have mentioned that this was from December 24th to 27th, 1959. And maybe we should, I should probably read that part before um, before going to the script. Oh, we have um, Hani um, putting his hand up and uh, let me unmute you so that you can speak. Okay, you should be able to unmute now and speak. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so that, that first clip, uh, was in fact the first meeting of the Islamic Youth Association of Canada of the United States and Canada, mm -hmm. which was an affiliate of the Federation of Islamic Associations of the United States and Canada, the first, I'm going to say, national Muslim organization in North America. Uh, the Federation at that time, which was the mid 50s, I believe that was the mid 50s, late 50s, uh, from Canada included London, Windsor, Edmonton. Uh, later Calgary joined and Toronto never became a member until much later until the 1960s. Uh, and that was our, our, our first meeting uh, as a group. And most of the people that were in that picture were from London, Detroit and Toledo, uh, Ohio. Uh, my wife and I were uh, early members of the organization were present in that video as were uh, many other Londoners. And uh, it was held in the house, as you saw, that was uh, the, the, the place of the first mosque in London and the first in Ontario. So that was an organizing meeting. I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, 
Did did you see yourself in the video? I'm at the, I'm at the head table. You are okay. So we're going to be watching it again. So maybe we can pause and uh, and you can point yourself out. And my and my partner is also uh, my spouse is, uh, is is prominent in the video as well. I, I went on to become the president of the Islamic Group Association, and my wife was uh, secretary. She's from Toledo, Ohio. There was a there's a close connection between the Muslims in, um, well, actually all of the places. Uh, uh, the Muslims in Toledo, Ohio, in Dearborn, Michigan in Cedar Rapids, Ohio, which were the founding American cities, and the Muslims in Edmonton, London, and Windsor, uh, the initial settlement in those cities was from the same area uh, in uh, 125, almost 125 years ago uh, of Ottoman Syria, which is now Lebanon. Uh, and they came from the villages of, of the Bekaa Valley in, in what is now Lebanon, and and settled uh, in this in 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 in, uh, in essentially in the Midwestern United States and uh, uh, and in uh, in London and Windsor and uh, Western Canada. My father was among those. Uh, people who uh, came at that time, as were many other Londoners. I noticed that Adib Hassan is on the, on, on the participation list. His father was, was one who came a little bit later. And you'll have some pictures later, Moscow, which we can point out some of the, those early settlers. Yes, thank you for those pictures. And thank you for the, the context that you gave to, to, to just that even seven second clip. That's amazing. We have a, a couple of more to go through. Um, there are some questions in the chat that I think, Sean, you might be able to speak to. Um, so one question is, are the titles of the reels the original ones? So like this one, Muslim Islamic Meet. Um, yeah, so first. Um, the, the titles come from uh, the descriptive information that we were given with the films. Um, I'm just trying to see if I have an example here. Um, but uh, on... That's not a good one, but you'll see most of the CFPL, like if you can see it, this a lot of CFPL had like index cards uh, that would help, uh, help us originally define sort of what was on the films. And so they would uh, have these little, little uh, you know, phrases that would describe what's on the film or what the stories are. And so, yes, the, the language or the, the titles are taken, taken from that. So we totally understand that uh, that's not necessarily uh, the best language to to, to use, um, but uh, it is the historical language that that w was given to us. So we we didn't we didn't change that. Um, yeah. The the other question was, um, is there a YouTube link or website to see all the archive clips? Good question. So we will be posting uh, these reels to YouTube. Um, it will, they will be available, uh, hopefully in April, we'll be able to get them up there. I think that's part of our planning right now. Uh, certainly if there's anybody from the London mosque who would like to have access to them beforehand, uh, certainly can reach out to myself and we'll make sure that there's copies, uh, copies available. Uh, we can send you, send you a link and, and make sure that the copies are available. Um, as you can tell, we are, uh, you know, fumbling through the, the scripts that are accompanied to the, to the, to the, um, to, to the, to the root to the uh, clips, uh, so that's something we're actually having to figure out as well for for YouTube. If uh, if anybody goes onto our website, we do actually have uh, an, exi an online exhibit on, about CFPL, and we actually did have actors come in to do the voiceovers uh, to make it seem like uh, it was uh, we we're watching news news programming. Uh, but uh, that's so we have to figure out how to do that for for the purposes of YouTube. Um, and the other thing too is we will have to ensure that the, the information is equally available in French. So we'll we'll be look, having to look at that as well. Okay, so I think um, we can move on to the next one, which is the exact same clip again, 
Um, it just, I guess, for context, I guess they, it seems like CFPL used the same footage to announce a separate uh, news item, um, which Sean will be reading now and from the script. Could we, so, when we get to the, when we get to the head table, could we, um, could we pause it? Yeah, I'll try my it? best. They go so okay. fast. I'll try my best. Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Ready and go. London's estimated 125 Muslim residents have taken the initiative in all of North America in organizing the first conference of the Islamic Youth Association of the United States and Canada. The conference, a two-day affair, ended this evening. It was held at the Muslim Mosque. Oh, oh I missed it. <laughs> you can... Okay, let me just find it again. Okay, it was held at the London, at the Muslim Mosque. Does anybody recognize anybody at that table? Or is it... I'm in the, I'm in the center. Oh, the okay. oh wow, okay. Joe Ossie from Cedar Rapids. The one on the set on the far side is a fellow by the name of Joe Ossie from Cedar Rapids. He was he was the president at that time. Who's, who's this? I can't remember who's on the right, uh, on the, who's closest to the camera. I can't, can't remember. Okay. Uh, did we miss your, um, your, uh, oh, honey was 19 years old. Wow. <laughs> um, I think you, you, you mentioned your wife is in the, in, did we miss her already? Did it already pass? No, she, she, okay. you'll see her she's standing up. She's quite prominent. All right at the okay. end. At the end. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's, let's keep going with the clip it's and just, then. I think it's just after this. Okay, all right. Okay, so I think this is where you stop. It was held at the Muslim Mosque. Okay. A fairly recent addition to the city's religious institutions. Delegates to the conference came from across Ontario and several American states. The general consensus of opinion was that the biggest problem facing the Muslim minority in North America is not discrimination, but the lack of religious <laughs> education and facilities. There's, there's my wife. <laughs> uh, right at the end. Yeah. Was she 19 as well? Uh, 18. 18, ah. So the person on the end, we figured out, the person that was sitting at the end of the table is a fellow by the name of Abdeen Jabara, who had family in London. The Jabaras live, there uh, two, fa two Jabara families lived in London at the time, but he's from Mancelona, Michigan, Northern Michigan. And at the time was attending the University of Michigan and ultimately became a lawyer and presently lives in New York City. Wow. I, did, did you get to the end of that, Sean? I've just got a couple of sentences. I think I'm, uh, I'm gonna miss the end, but I'll, uh, I'll okay. just read it out. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Many of the delegates felt that North Americans were misinformed about Islam, particularly with regard to such popular issues as, as, the, state, as the station of women in Muslim society. Muslim associations are facing this problem and trying to solve it. There we go. That's a much better view, I think. <laughs> that's also my wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why I paused it. I recognized her. Um, but thank you for that contact. That's amazing that we can see, um, that you can see yourselves in these. Yeah. So Mariam Hano asked if there's anybody from the Musa family in the chat. I, I can't remember. She probably could find out from their family, but I don't think that the Mdukha people had arrived in London by 1959. That's another village uh, in, in the neighborhood of, oh, of most of the Londoners who settled here in the beginning. Uh, yes, and she says maybe it was still early. Uh, this is again the first clip, so you, maybe you'll find them um, in the later clips because we have them. Uh, we have a couple until until 1979, I think, is the latest one. So maybe so, so, uh, we'll keep going. So if I could just comment, uh, I don't want to monopolize this, but up up until up until 1960, uh, virtually all the immigration to London and I think to most of Canada. Uh, your archivist probably can figure this out better than I, 
was, was family reunification. Mm -hmm. So the early settlers could bring their relatives. I mean, they would bring somebody who was married to a relative who could then bring another branch of the family, if you know what I mean. So the early people who came to London were primarily from the two villages of Karaun and Balu in, in the, in the Pakaa Valley of Lebanon. It was in 1960 or so that Canada opened its immigration act. And that's when we started receiving uh, the large numbers of, of Muslim immigrants uh, from, from South Asia, from India and Pakistan, but also meant that we, it opened it up for um, Muslims from other parts of, of, uh, of the world, including other areas of Lebanon that were not family related. I know, I know we're still on the first clip really, but I'm curious, how, how come London? And why we not Tor Toronto or uh, Toronto? Well, I guess that would well, be the obvious question. Well, there were a significant number in Toronto, but they were dispersed. And, there, and there's another factor, um, which I was gonna talk about in one of the photographs that I sent uh, on. Um, Look at the early Muslims that came came from Ottoman Turkey, uh, and and most of them were young men, no spouses, hardly any women, hardly any women at all. Uh, Christians from the same area of Syria, Lebanon, uh, brought their spouses. So Christian. Arabs, Christian Syrians, Christian Lebanese had settled already. And so the affiliations, the socialization was not across religious lines, but much different actually than the United States, but actually around uh, ethnic and national lines. So my father's, for instance, my father's uh, early socialization and, and our family's early so so socialization was with Christians from that part of the world. There were no Muslim organizations, there was no home. And even for the Christians, there weren't churches. There weren't ethnic churches in Canada for them. So most of them became assimilated into uh, the mainstream churches, United of the Catholic. Some joined the Anglican church, uh, but our social home really was with Christian Arabs up until, uh, the mid 50s, mid 1950s, because even the family reunification didn't start until 1949. I don't know if my sister is on this, my sister Jamili is on this call, but she has documents that illustrate the racism endemic in Canadian immigration policies that deny the entry even for family unification. Okay, so the uh, the next clip, if there's any volunteers, it's a, it's a very short introduction. I think uh, I think it's one sentence because this is the only clip that has sound. Yes. So anybody wants to uh, take I, up I know the challenge? I I did get a message that um, Zeba wanted to um, read a part a part of the script, but I think. I wonder if uh, Sean, if you, like I could read this one because I, I think it'd be nicer if, if uh, say about like one of the volunteers read the, lar the longer ones because this is the one with the sound. So I'll I'll go ahead with this one. It's very short, and then um, Zeba, thank you for volunteering. I'll pass it on to you for the next one if that's okay. Is that is that okay? Okay, let's um, play that. Just let this one end. Okay, so this, this afternoon, James Khalil of Detroit, president of the Federation of Islamic Associations in the US and Canada had this comment to make for our news cameras. The basic problems confronting the Muslims in the United States and Canada are lack of religious facilities for the propagation of Islam and not religious intolerance. To solve this problem, Qasem Alwan, previous president of the Federation of Islamic Associations, and myself journeyed to the United Arab Republic 
and met with the President of the United Arab Republic, Jamal Abdel Nasser. At this meeting, the problems were discussed, and the President of the United Arab Republic authorized the sending of four imams to the United States and Canada to teach the Islamic religion, five completely equipped libraries, and five scholarships to Al-Azhar University, which is the oldest university in the world. Also, at this time, the rector of Al-Azhar University presented a gift of 300 Qurans and 3,000 copies of Principles of Islam, and the Islamic Center of Washington started courses in Islam to graduate young imams, whom it is hoped will serve the theological needs of the 150,000 Muslims in the United States and Canada. So again, for context, that was uh, dated December 26, 1959. Uh, we're open to any, if anybody has any comments or anything about that clip. Again, please um, use the hand function or something. Oh, Anver has wants to say something. Well, no, I was just fascinated by this idea of, of uh, in thinking about Islamic education, this turn to the foreign, this turn to, um, and it's it's still something that we struggle with. There's a large conversation in the academy around even thinking about how do we make Islam domestic? How do we make it American or how do we make it Canadian? My colleague at Yale, Zarina Graywall, has this really amazing book on, on Muslim travelers for education purposes. And it's always this idea of going abroad and there's a certain mysticism or mystical element associated with getting knowledge from the Muslim world. Uh, and yet what, what's, um, what I also struggle with is there's also the cultural divide that never gets broached. And so uh, this is an issue that started, that was there. It's an issue that still stays with um, the community as well and is still a subject of considerable interest for me as an academic. So I just wanted to identify the continuity of that, of that challenge. Mm -hmm. But also what's been exciting for me directly yeah. the is thinking about how do we create a more domestic space for the study of Islam, both in the academy and outside. So. Uh, that's been that's been part of the journey for Micah, for the institute, and and for myself as a director. Thank you, Amber. I think so. There was um, two people with their hands up, and I will um, I'll start with Hani because he was first, and then we'll go to you, Maryam. The four imams that Jim Khalil spoke about. Um, I can't remember all four of them. I remember one was Hamoud Abdel Ati who went to Edmonton. Uh, a fellow by the name of Mohanna went to Dearborn, Michigan, which is where Jim Khalil was from. And Imam Khidr went to uh, Toledo. Actually, he married us later. Uh, and I don't remember. I don't remember where the fourth one went. Didn't come to. Didn't come to London. But the first one, one of them went to Edmonton. What Abdul Ati was brilliant, and to what uh, Enver spoke about, he was the most adept at acculturation, and he wrote a, a book which became one of the uh, texts that young Canadian and American youth look to as an instructional uh, booklet. It's still available on the web. It's called the Simon Focus. Tragically, he died very young. Um, he, he went to teach at Temple University and, the, and died. I, I, I would guess he was probably around 50 when he died. I don't know for sure. But he was one of the ones that uh, we really looked up to. By the way, prior to that, I'm only aware of three imams who were available in our to us here in London, they were all in, in, in Detroit, in the Detroit, greater Detroit area. We had an, an Albanian imam and there was a, a fairly significant Albanian community in Deer, it was actually in Harker Woods, Michigan. Um, and I believe that they came when the communist takeover of Albania in, in the 1940s. And uh, 
the imam of the Albanian community was the one that was closest to the Islamic Youth Association. And he was our, he was our mentor. And then there was a, a Shia imam in, in Detroit, Imam Juwez Shiri. Uh, and another, by the way, we didn't differentiate. If you looked at that picture of the, in, the, in the video clips, um, Muslims that were Shia and Sunni, didn't, we didn't differentiate. We didn't even know what it meant to, to be different. And, and uh, so Jimmy Khalil's family actually was Shia. Uh, but he was speaking to all of us, and he, of course, met with the, uh, the Shaq al Azhar, which is a, a Sunni institution. And, and the third imam was Imam Hussain uh, Kharoub, who served in Dearborn, Michigan. He came from, from one of the villages in, uh, in Lebanon, and he was more a social guy who took care of funerals and weddings. And he came up here to perform many marriages to London, I mean. Uh, to perform many marriages and, and funerals uh, here in the city. Thank you. I'd like to speak, I'd like to speak to Amber sometime about what he was talking about in terms of the acculturation mm -hmm. and the need for imams to have the social context. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot. Um, I, will ha I mean, Amber can just, He's very good. He's he can go on with, on that topic. I think um, he suggested a book for everyone um, in the chat as well. So if anybody wants to talk um, more, or if anybody wants to learn more about uh, what he just mentioned, but um, I I want to get to the other two that put their hand up as well. So um, Miriam, I'm just going to unmute you. Okay, thank you. Can I, I can't go online. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I can't go on video. Can I? Um, I oh, it doesn't matter. Actually, it's fine. I can okay, just... okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to go back to a point Anver said. It. It's such an interesting idea because a couple of days ago, I was talking to, um, I think my mother about the dialect that we speak here in London, this Lebanese dialect that we speak here. And it's so different than what they speak currently in Lebanon, because it's from, I'd say like the 1950s or the 1960s from Lebanon at that time. So it's kind of like the Acadian um, French where it's caught in that time period it came over here and it stayed that way. So there is, I would say there's an actual Arabic dialect in London, Ontario that's indigenous to people that came from Lebanon at a certain point. So there's a connection right there. Um, um, and another idea of how, um, uh, Anver, you were saying about domestic Islam. Um, the only Islam I've ever learned was here in the West. I was born here um, to Muslim parents. Um, so that's where it becomes domestic. It's when people who are born here they carry it here as like they've learned it here and um that's that's kind of domestic islam like new world islam versus old world world islam i think i would say so i would say i'm a new world person who learned islam because i learned everything here in north america um and there's probably many like me and that's where you're going to find that group of people who can help you with your research um, anyway, that, those were the two comments that I had. And this is an awesome, like, this is such a cool thing that you guys are doing. We're really reaching back into the annals of the Muslim history here in London. It's such a cool thing. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for your comments, Mariam. Um, I think uh, we're so glad that this uh, this, this is useful um, and uh, to the Muslim, uh, the Muslim community in London. And uh, we did try our best to invite as many um, Londoners as we could. So, and I'm glad to see we have such a great turnout for this too. Um, I I apologize, I missed who the last person was who put their hand up, but I do I think we do need to get going for the next few clips because uh, we have a, a lot more to show. Um, I think I will, uh, Zeba did um, volunteer to read the next one. So I will, uh, let's uh, you unmute and then you'll be able to read the next one I'll, and I'll count you down whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, sounds good. I'll press play now. Okay, so start.
Okay, so this is November 4th, 1961. Another anniversary was observed in London last night. Some 200 persons attended a dinner at the Panorama restaurant, commemorating the fifth anniversary of the founding of the London Muslim Mosque. The banquet was sponsored by the London section of the Canadian Muslim Benevolent Society. Imam Ahmoud Abdul Ati of Edmonton was one of three speakers who addressed the gathering. The anniversary marks the purchase of an Oxford Street house five years ago, which since that time has been undergoing renovations to convert it to a mosque. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, uh, it, it did. Uh, thank you for reading even the the date and things like that. I should have maybe paused it for, for you because I, uh, again, the clip was only 25 seconds on the, which is not enough time obviously to read that giant paragraph. Uh, so thank you for reading that. Um, and uh, I, 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 I want to make sure we have time for the rest of the clips too. So I wonder if um, maybe we can keep going with the clips um, and then have the, try to have the larger discussion at the end because um, this is really wonderful conversations we're having, of course, but I just want to make sure we can screen all the clips for you folks and then talk about them afterwards. And we can always go back. I can always go back and play whatever you'd like. Um, does that work for, for you, Sean? I think maybe I don't see any any other um, uh, any, anybody else volunteering to read the script. So I guess we can go back and forth now. You want me to go next? Sure, let's do that. I'm getting serenaded in the background, so I apologize for that. Just to assume that it's the, 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 the music of the day. Okay, let me just get to the end of that. Okay. Ooh. Okay, a couple of seconds. All right. So August 11th to 14th, 1962, Muslim mosque fire. And I'm pressing play now. Faulty wiring has been blamed for another weekend fire in London. Early yesterday morning, a blaze heavily damaged the London Muslim Mosque on Oxford Street West. Fire Chief Milton Mathers said late this afternoon that investigations revealed a locked thermostat on a small fan heater, which apparently caused the wiring to overheat at a joint. Lost in the fire was the library, consisting mainly of works on Islamic religion and philosophy. A $1,300 broadloom rug, which had never been touched by a shoe, was partly burned, water-soaked, and soot-stained. Well, I guess this time... <laughs> I, I should have, uh, it should have uh, probably had some breaks in here, just to... Okay, I see. Well, well we can enjoy the silent clip then until, until it's over. A couple more seconds left for this. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this next one is um, titled the London Muslim Mosque Cornerstones, a co cornerstone ceremony, ceremony. So June 27, 1964. This is this one's a little bit longer. Um, I will start. I can read this one. London's Muslim community today marked another milestone in the rebuilding of its mosque on Oxford Street. The original building, a converted home, was destroyed by fire almost two years ago. Disheartened by the loss, but with new hope, members of the Muslim community laid plans, uh, laid plans for a new mosque. Today, they saw their hopes nearing reality during a cornerstone ceremony. And then a man is speaking. Um, Albert Hassan is the chairman of the board directing the new construction. Uh, Mohammed Masood of Montreal put one of the two cornerstones in place. A Muslim community leader from New Jersey, Ali Malidin of, new, of Jersey City placed the other stone in position. The construction, which began about a year ago, is expected to be completed by this fall. The new London Muslim mosque will co cost about $125,000 with many members of the community doing some of the work themselves. So that was that clip. Um, so as you can see, the, these, this clip, 
the one after it is going to be focused on the mosque itself. The, I think even the, the next few are going to be focused on the mosque itself. So we'll, we'll go through them and then we'll do, our, um, we'll have some time to have a larger discussion. So uh, Sean, uh, take it away in three, two, one. London's Muslim community officially opened its new $120,000 mosque last night. The building is situated on Oxford Street West. The new mosque replaces the community's original building, which was partially destroyed by fire in August of 1961. The remains were then torn down and construction of the new building got underway in August of 1963. Prayer was offered last night prior to the official opening of the mosque's worship area. The acting head of the London mosque, Imam uh, Mahmoud Yoma, then proceeded to open the door leading to the main worship section of the building. He was followed by various guest Mohammedan leaders and other adherents of the faith. Once inside, the congregation again joined together in prayer. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, the, the next one is um, dated August 10th to 10 to the August 8th to the 10th and the 12th, 1969. Um, London Muslim Mosque welcomes Imam A.M. Katab. Uh, so I'll read this one. Last night in London, an ecumenical type dinner was held at London's Muslim Mosque to welcome the new Imam A.M. Khatab. Imam means the leader of the, player, of the prayer. He is the London Mosque's first. Since it opened in 1964, prayers have been led by members of the congregation. Mr. Khatab comes to London from Edmonton, although he is a native of Egypt. He'll be commuting to Waterloo, where he will work for his doctorate in sociology. At the welcoming dinner were local federal politicians and representatives of the Catholic and Protestant faiths. Close to 150 attended the dinner. There are 500 um, attached to the congregation. Okay. And uh, I'll press play in a few, in just three, two, one for you, Sean. An estimated 200 members of London's Muslim community gathered tonight at the London Muslim Mosque to, to welcome His Excellency Alif Gabara, the Lebanese ambassador to Canada to the city. Following his presentation to guests in the mosque lower hall and a greeting from local and federal government representatives, Mr. Gabara gave a formal address to the gathering. The text of the ambassador's speech dealt with Lebanon's position in current Middle East problems. Okay, so this is um, the last, the last uh, clip that we have that has a script, um, and it's the second last clip in, in, in total. The last clip itself doesn't have a script, so it will be a silent film, um, but uh, I will read this last, uh, I'll read the second, this is the second last clip with a script. So I'll read that, that one now. Um, this one is dated September 30th, 1970, memorial service held at the London Muslim Mosque for Egyptian President Nasser. A memorial service for the late president of Egypt, General Gabo Abdel Nasser was held tonight at the London Muslim Mosque on Oxford Street West. About 150 members of the London Arab community, many of them weeping, gathered to pay their respects to the Arab leader. Officiating at the service was Imam A. Khatab. The Reverend uh, George Goff of Metropolitan United Church also spoke briefly. President Nasser will be buried tomorrow and one million Egyptians are expected to take part in the funeral. I guess I was supposed to wait 10 seconds, a hold for 10 seconds in the script. I wasn't sure, so. Next time we'll need a director. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Okay, so again, um, this is the final script. Um, it doesn't have, sorry, this is the final clip. It doesn't have a script. So it's just, it'll, we'll just, um, what you'll be watching is just a silent clip at this point. And I'll play that now. This is the last clip. Okay, so that was uh, that was all the clips. Um, uh, well, there wasn't, I, if I remember uh, from our conversation, Sean, there wasn't any there was any context for that last uh, clip at all. The only thing we can guess is that it was some sort of lecture, possibly lecturing about Islam, um, just from the clip itself. But if um, this is where uh, we ask the audience, I guess, if there's any context or clues that you may know about about this specific gathering. I'm sure we'd love to hear it because, again, there was no context for that clip that, that we know of. Well, there's a comment in the chat. Um, could be Shriners. I'm not sure what the Shriners are. It, it seemed like it was some sort of missionary conference. I, I don't think there, yeah. uh, there was probably any representation from members of the community at all, but it, it seemed mm -hmm. to be like, I don't know, a Christian community imposing sort of their their perspective on on the Muslim world for the for the audience. I mean, if you look at the I see, I think I'll, that's what it looks like. Yes. And yeah. actually, you make a good point that the first few seconds do give a bit of context, probably. Um, so what I'll do now is um, I will stop sharing this video. Um, we do have uh, and I'll go back to my slide just one second. I'm just just trying to make sure that we have enough time for everything. Um, we did invite some. I mean, we already heard from um, Hani, uh, so thank you, Hani, for uh, giving so much context for the clips already. But um, we did uh, we did invite um, Hani Hassan and Adib um, Hassan to speak today. Um, they do represent uh, the London Muslim community, and. Um, yeah, so um, I guess we could start with um, Hani, if, if you if you have a few minutes, uh, if you can, um, if you have any words for a few minutes, and then we'll pass it on to um, Adib, and then we'll try to have a again a larger discussion with everybody else as well. And um, uh, Hani, I also have your the the photos that you sent as well, so if we, I can go to the next slide for that too for you. So this, uh, well, as the as the caption indicates, these are the members of the Canadian Muslim Benevolent Society that was alluded to in one of the video flip clips, and it's actually the founding uh, organization for the uh, London Muslim Mosque. The members uh, shown here are the ones that uh, raised the money and and built bought the bought the house uh, that ultimately had the fire in it. Uh, you can see there's two groups of people in that. The, the older gentlemen, uh, in the, mainly in the top row, um, were a part of the early settlement. And most of them came to London prior to the first war or shortly after. I believe Adib's father, who is, uh, my dad and Adib's father are in that. And looking at it, as you view the picture, uh, from the left, my dad is third and Adib's father is fourth. They're brothers. Uh, in that picture. Um, then, then the rest are uh, younger men, all of whom at the time of this picture were single. Uh, and I think I mentioned that earlier. And of course, that's the house in the background. So this picture was taken in 1950, 
D2. Uh, and that was about the time, no, they bought the building later. The, the, the society was established in 1952. You'll see that my name is there someplace, but I'm, I'm not pictured because I was only 12 at the time. I was, I was a scribe for the society. <laughs> And, and your name is uh, on the on the right there underneath the, uh, the Barakat right, yeah. Barakat. Yes, 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 I see it. Yeah, I, I was 12 years old at the time. So we so also this have this photo. This is the Canadian Muslim Benevolent Society and the picture taken in 1955. The Federation of Islamic Associations of the United States and Canada held their annual convention here in London in 1955. It was quite a big, quite a big deal. And I'm surprised CFPL didn't have video from that because I know that they took some and I, uh, I, I did go back to see if I could if we'd missed something um, but based on how uh, we've described the collection uh, nothing popped up that matched this so uh, Sean I was gonna I was gonna send you a, a chat message do, do you have documentation from the free press as you as you mentioned in the in the earliest dry, uh, slide black the Blackburn family owned both the television and the newspaper in town, no. and they were and they were pretty good uh, at at documenting. We probably didn't agree with a lot of their editorial content or their presentation, but they were. I think that they were generally sincere in wanting to represent the community uh, to to the public in the city. And uh, uh, and I know the Free Press has a lot of documentation uh, that may be relevant to the archives. The, so this. Um... Sorry, the London Free Press, uh, their photo collection, I think, is at Western. Oh, okay. So this this is the Ladies Society in 1955, and they hosted the convention here in 1955. So my mom is on the far right, and Dave's mom is standing behind her, just to give you some reference of some people who were on this. Um, they all came later. Uh, Adi's mom and my mom came in 1939, just before the, the Second War. Uh, however, there is one lady in this picture who was born in Canada, and she's the lady seated on the left side, uh, Mrs. Addie Seed, who came here from Saskatchewan, but I think that her family was, is Anissa on the cup? I don't, anyways, her family, I think, is from Kirkland Lake, but she was born in Canada. And she and another woman who was in London may have been among the earliest Canadian born Muslim women. Thank you, Hani, for, the, uh, for um, giving so much context for, to these photos. I think those were the last. Oh, yeah, those are the, you, you sent us three. So um, thank you so much for the wealth of knowledge that you've provided um, today. Um, I also, um, Adib, uh, I, I have also uh, unmuted you as well if you'd like to join in. While we're waiting, I, I, something I just was reflecting on in terms of the uh, in terms of the footage that we watched, uh, the, the last the last clip that uh, we shared is is a little bit uh, I, I don't know it doesn't fit with the others, and I think it's because the perspective on it is is not one of the community, um, at least with the, the the first clips that we saw, they all were documentation of the community's activities itself. It wasn't anybody else trying to sort of uh, label or put together a story that wasn't of the community's own. Uh, what I think Micah's trying to do, and certainly what we're hoping to support Micah in doing, is being able to sort of surface those stories that are created by community members themselves so that you can mm -hmm. tell your own story. Um, we're fortunate that we have uh, the CFPL footage of that, of that time, um, but uh, certainly what we hope we'll see is that uh, there will be more of this type of material surfacing so that the stories will be there and will be of the community's own telling. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Sean. Um, if anybody else also wants to um, join in and 
uh, into the discussion, please let me know in the chat so we can unmute you um, or we can raise use the raise hand function uh, while we wait for um, Adib to call into the Zoom. We have a few minutes left before um, we'll have to sign off. Does anybody have anything, uh, any comments, uh, questions, um, suggestions uh, that they'd like to make? Uh, please let me know. Oh, thank you. Um, right, Fred, I will ask you to un I will unmute you. You should be able to speak now. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. I can recall uh, another mosque that was at the corner of Oxford Street and Dundas Street that I went to with my parents. Uh, it was an old house. I, it, we didn't use it there that often, but I recall the building. It's now been torn down. Uh, there was a post office there at one point, and I think it's part of a strip plaza now. And then we ended up going over to Ox Oxford Street but also, um, I can recall having services in a number of people's homes, many of whom uh, the spouses um, were shown in that last picture. Thank you, uh, Fred, for that. I didn't know there was, um, see, this is the thing. Uh, this is why we, I love these kinds of events. Um, uh, we, we learn so much from those who actually lived the history and, um, you know, uh, what we uh, what we mostly know of London's, at least the, the mosque there is that they were essentially the first mosque in Ontario. Um, but there are often, you know, they, uh, these these um, gatherings often start in, in the homes. So, I'm not surprised if there was another one that was maybe less official. Um, I think I, I think Adib was able to come into the meeting. Um, can you hear us, uh, Adib? Could you yes. speak? Yes. yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm having technical difficulties with my my uh, microphone. Um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing to us the. The history that uh, we have in London, it brought back memories for those of us who have been in London all our lives. And um, the purchasing of the house uh, in 1957 and renovating it as a mosque was a, was a uh, it was the pride of the, of the London community and uh, devastating when the uh, fire took place. But the uh, community took that as an opportunity to build a uh, purpose-built mosque on the site. And um, you saw the grand opening and the placement of the stone, the cornerstone in 1964, I was there. Uh, and I remember that vividly, that they were standing at the top of the stairs. Uh, if you recall, I was standing on the sidewalk at the base of the stairs watching that, that unfold. I was 11 years old at the time, but I still remember that. It was a um, very happy, momentous uh, time and event for in this community. And uh, it was nice to see the uh, opening ceremony and the, the first communal prayers take place in the mosque after it, uh, it was opened by uh, Muhammad Juma, who is still with us today in the community. So nice, nice memories, nice memories. Uh, I think it shows the, the depth and the, uh, the roots that we have in this community in London and in Ontario. Uh, and the community has been um, contributing back to society at large as it grows. Uh, and uh, we have Muslims that 
excel in all fields, uh, medicine, engineering, education, business, just to name a few. The community is well rooted and is now, uh, well, certainly part of the mosaic, but has become mainstream in North America. And uh, as I often say, and I told to, to Hanny, that we are living the dream. We are living the dream that our parents had. So, and we're, we're blessed, we're blessed to be, to be where we are and to have what we have as a community, the uh, love and the brother or sisterhood that we have and we enjoy. That is a blessing. The uh, challenges that we face, Islamophobia is uh, right up on top and uh, we're resilient and we will see this uh, challenge through inshallah. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Th thank you so much for um, everything that you said. I think uh, I can't think of a better way to kind of end off um, this event tonight. Um, I, I want to thank you all for joining us today, um, London's community for um, being so wonderfully, um, just so wonderful as I as I tried to connect with them and uh, you know have them join our event today. And um, I, I love the enthusiasm that I, from from the community. I'd love to come maybe uh, visit one day as well. I haven't been to London actually yet. Um, but uh, I again, I think thank you uh, everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll thank you also to Sean for um, helping us um, have this event as well. Um, if anybody wants to get into contact with either of us, um, our contact info is on the on the screen here. Um, so Sean's and mine as well. Um, and we also have the specifically the email for um, the Muslims in Canada archives on there as well. Um, and uh, I think just before we leave, I did want to uh, mention that we, um, the Muslims in Canada archives just uh, kind of launched their uh, website. So um, our website is now live and um, it is, uh, it's essentially Muslims in Canada archives.ca. Uh, so if you'd like to check out and learn more about us, um, there is uh, that's a wealth of information on there. Um, as well as um, we also have our uh, a, 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 an event cup um, coming up in March, um, where we are showcasing the work that the Muslims in Canada archive has done so far since its inception in tw late 2019. Um, if you'd like to join us in March or March 31st, uh, we'd love to have you um, and uh, well I'll Essentially, I'll, I'll be presenting what we've done so far. Um, we'll look at some of the uh, folks that have donated records to MICA so far, and um, they'll, they'll be speaking as well. Um, and we'll hear from other supporters and collaborators um, of MICA that day as well. So again, thank you all for joining us um, today. We have two more minutes um, left. If anybody has anything they'd like to say, um, I think I will end the recording here. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us. Oh, so we do have some people. Um, just one minute, I just wanted to end this recording for now.